Cool. I'll just get us started on the community agreements and we hopefully folks will join in the middle. So as I said, today we're gonna to continue our conversation on um, New York City's food system. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how the food gets from the farm to our plates. And before we get started, we have a couple of community agreements. Uh, we want everyone to feel like they can speak up, but also allow for other people to speak. So take space and make some space. Um, this is a brave space. We want you to feel free to share your thoughts and ideas and to be patient with other people when they share theirs as well. Um, we want to be honest and as transparent as possible. Uh, we zero tolerance for any hate or discrimination or prejudice. Please be kind and mindful about the tone that you're using, especially online, um, and also be open to learning and growing. And then tech specifics, please keep your microphone muted unless you're speaking. Uh, this helps to reduce background noise and just um, helps folks to focus on who on the person that's talking. And if you are able to, unless you have some like commu previously communicated reason, please turn on your video. We just want to be able to interact with you. And the way that these lessons were designed was to be done in person. And so we want to try and mimic that as much as possible. So I'm going to give you all a chance. If you can hear me, please turn on your screen. Otherwise, we will assume that either you are you've stepped away from your screen or you are not paying attention. And I can't see my chat. So one second. If for some reason you can't turn on your screen, tell us in the chat. But if you could, that would be really great. Thank you. Feel free to use the chat if you have any questions, uh, any thoughts. Uh, respect the space. Please don't uh, don't have anything in your background that might be inappropriate or distracting. And we are recording this meeting mostly for folks who aren't able to join. And also take care of yourself. If you need to stop, step away and take a couple of breaths, please do. Now, um, in terms of what to expect in our conversation today, we're going to talk about the history of the food system in New York City. Then we'll walk through the current landscape of food in New York City. And we'll also talk about um, Growing YC's role in the local food systems. And then we'll, we'll have a, a couple of questions and comments. So for the first icebreaker, um, I would like a volunteer to, tell, to think about a food or a vegetable that you had as part of your dinner last night. And if you can map out how that fruit or vegetable got from the farm where it was grown to your dinner plate. So anybody who would like to volunteer to tell us either about what you had last night or what you're eating right now, how that got from where it was being grown to where to your plate. I didn't eat dinner last night. <laughs> did you have lunch, Miriam? Yeah. yeah. What did you have for lunch? With the greens. It was what? I had chipotle. Okay. Um, let's. What was in your chipotle? Uh, I got rice and beans with chicken. Okay. Let's talk about the beans. Where do you think your beans came from? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> do you think it grew in a farm or it came from a grocery store? I think maybe a grocery store. Okay. Can you think about what other process um, might be involved in getting your beans from where they're growing to your plate? What would they have to do? I don't think I understood what you're trying to say. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to map out the process of how your food gets from where it's being grown on a farm um, to your plate. So what I'm asking is, can you think of certain steps that would that you would need in order to take from like the seed, planting a bean seed to the to the bean that appears in your burrito at Chipotle? Does that make sense? Yeah, and anybody really can join in and answer any yeah. questions if you want. Yeah. Or if you have any ideas or thoughts. Um. Go. I mean, a second party would probably transport it, like, because it'll go pretty far. Um, 
lots of steps. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, let's think. Let's think from you have a seed. We're thinking about beans right now. Um, how does your bean get from the farm where it grows to your plate? What does what needs to happen in between? Wow, well, you gotta grow the bean. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. The bean is grown. Yep. You gotta harvest it. Mm -hmm. You gotta make sure there's no bugs. Check it. Yeah. It's uh, pretty good. Tap it. Something else. Put it on a truck or plane. Okay. Warehouse. Another warehouse. Another warehouse. Nice. <laughs> or, um, okay. Turn it again. That's pretty good. Okay, so we're in a warehouse and it gets to maybe a grocery store, somebody picks it up and then someone has to cook it and then eventually it gets to you wherever you're eating, right? And Thanks. And, yeah. Sorry, what, what were you saying, oh, Angelica? Like package it and stuff. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. yeah, exactly, right? So when we think about our local food system, we live in New York City. Um, and looking back to the first time that New York City was settled, which was in 10,000 BC, the initial um, communities that settled in New York City were the Iroquois and the Algonquian um, indigenous communities. And they were the predominant group of people that were living in, in the New York State area by 11,000 AD, right? Most of them were either farmers, they grew a lot of corn, beans, winter squash, and that's where the um, growing practice of the Three Sisters method came from. Um, some of them were fisher, were, uh, some of them hunted beavers or small animals and, and sold the fur, and some of them um, caught fish. In 1524, the first outsider, uh, came to the New York State area, and his name was Giovanni de Verzano, Verrazano, and a, uh, a bridge is named right after him. And then in 1609, the Dutch were the first people to claim um, the New York State area, and they called it New Netherland. And they, um, in addition to getting the, the food from the indigenous communities, they also bought a lot of their fur. And in 1626, the Dutch bought the island of Manhattan from the Native American communities for about $1,000 um, in our time. In 1664, the British captured and renamed the colony as New York City in order of the Duke of New York. And by the 19th century, New York City was a, a main port and hub for um, a lot of immigrants coming from Eastern Europe, right? So this is just a timeline of um, New York City as it was settled over the years. Dutch purchasing city. And I uploaded this presentation so you can go slower and see how New York City, sorry. Uh, you can go slower and see how New York City um, changed. And so a lot of the immigrants who are coming into New York City were mostly farmers. Um, and New York City essentially used to be a huge farming community. As I shared um, when we were in the market, New York, a lot of the, a lot of um, New York City in the olden days actually used to be for farming. In the left-hand corner, this is Sheep's Meadow in Central Park, and it's called Sheep's Meadow because they used to graze sheep there. And um, on the right, there's the Felton Fish Market down by South Street, South Street Seaport, which is now uh, the financial district. And um, here again, in the bottom left, you can see Brooklyn. These are mostly farms and marshes. Um, so a lot of New York City used to be agricultural land. But as the city kept growing and as the, the country kept growing and we moved from smaller and mid-sized family farms to, to fewer and larger industrial farms, and you can see that in the graph, there was a huge decline in the, the number and the size of the number, but an increase in the size of farms in New York, sorry, in the US. Um, so as the city keep grew, keep, kept expanding, all of the agricultural, um, in, all, all the agriculture moved from inside the city to outside in order to make space and room for um, both economic infrastructure as well as uh, residential places, right? And as I sh was sharing about the financial district, no one exactly wanted to live next to a fishing community. And so that fishing community moved from down in, in the Fida district all the way up to the Bronx. 
And um, in the 1980s, if you look in this graph where there's this like sharp decline, that was around, sorry, 19, sorry, in the 1940s. That was around um, the Nixon era, and there was this like huge movement to increase the uh, production of agriculture. And um, there's a famous min uh, state minister, I think, like a minister of agriculture, who um, said, "Get go big or go home." And so there was a decline in the in the family farms, and so most people started growing commodity crops like corn and cotton, uh, things that they could sell for export and not stuff that we could eat. Now, if you look at New York City right now, this is a map of all the different food systems all over New York City. It's a little bit old, but it's the only one that shows uh, both the energy systems, the water systems, the food system, and the waste system. And you can see green, the green markets represent a lot of all these green dots if you see me on this on the map. And up here in the Bronx, I don't know if you all can see my um, my cursor, but up here in the Bronx, there's Hunts Point distribution area. A lot of the food that comes into New York City, whether it's in the bodega, whether it's in a restaurant, um, whether it's on the street corners, a lot of it comes through the Hunts Point Distribution Center in the Bronx. Um, it's a, it, statistics show it's about 19 billion pounds of food that's distributed through New York City from 42, from, oh, sorry. So yeah, 19 billion pounds of food is distributed throughout New York City and we have about 42,000 separate points of sale outlets like bodegas, restaurants, and different places, right? Hans Point is the largest geographical hub for New York City. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about green market as well. We have a green market co-warehouse right in the Bronx because we want to see um, the food, current food system changing. So if you look at where food um, in New York City is coming from, one would expect that a lot of our food is coming from international sources, but actually when you look at the statistics, so if you look at this graph, the blue indicates local or domestic sources, while the red indicates international sources. So you can see a lot of our food is actually coming from domestic sources, which is really great. Um, but the more local you are, the better it is because we are going to talk about it in the next slide. But um, this for me was very surprising. I actually thought a lot of our food in New York City was coming from abroad, but that is actually not the case. So when we talk about food system, like I was trying to get you all to, to chart the path of the beans from when it was grown to when it was being harvested. We have a bunch of different product, i uh, sorry, a bunch of different steps that you have to go through um, to get from growing your food to, to receiving it as a consumer, right? So usually in the food system or the food pathway, the beginning step is the food production where you're growing and harvesting. And right now we're looking at a non-local food pathway. So imagine if these beans were coming from um, Peru or Mexico or somewhere outside of the US, right? So first a farmer would grow and harvest them. And then depending on whether the processing is in, in the US or outside of the US, it would take a boat, a ship, sorry, a ship, a boat, a, a plane or a truck. Sometimes it's stored before it's processed. Sometimes it's processed and then stored. Um, and then it will it end up either at a wholesale or a retail uh, vendor. And then somebody will market it. You'll go to the grocery store or you'll be watching TV and there'll be an ad for beans telling you these are the best beans, you should buy them. And then you're finally convinced um, and then you buy those beans, take them home, and either you dispose of whatever is left, or you might be able to recycle it, and then it goes back. If you're able to recycle, you reuse it, that process goes back into the production stage, right? Now, if you look at this um, pathway, there's a lot of, there are a lot of different one uh, transport transport um, mechanisms, but there was also a lot of different steps, and it's very confusing, and it's very complicated, right? Um, the disadvantage of this, um, in addition to it being complicated and then there being a middleman, meaning that the farmer who's growing and selling might not always get back as much as the people here in the end who are the, like the middle people. Um, it also means that there's a lot of air pollution with all of these transportation mechanisms. And I'm wondering, does anyone have any ideas what could be a good solution to a non-local food system? 
like instead of going through all of these pathways, what would be a good way to offset all of this? Ideas. Oh, Andrea, go ahead. Um, maybe just removing the middlemen and providing a direct connection between the farmers and the consumers. Exactly. Thank you so much. And so on our next, when you compare a local food pathway, you can see number one, it's less complicated. There's um, rarely a middle person and the person who's growing, oh, sorry, I'm going to, I'll go back to it. And the person who's, who, the farmer or the person growing the food um, ends up getting a lot more on the dollar than, than if it was a non-local food system. I also want to point out in the non-local food pathway, on average, it takes your food about 2,000 miles to get to you. And it's about weeks or months in between the days when your food is harvested and when it's sold. So by the time it gets to you, the quality is not as good as when it was first harvested, right? And when you look at a local food pathway, that is a lot simpler. There are fewer um, steps. You see, you'll start here with growing production and harvesting, and then the food gets processed if it needs to be processed. For example, if you think of a farmer's market or a farm stand, if you're um, harvesting carrots, you all you need to do is maybe wash them, remove the dirt, and then um, you, you bundle them up, then you store them in a warehouse, like let's say at the Green Market Co warehouse, and then you, you take it to a farmer, you sell it to, you could either sell it to, um, to an aggregator like us who collects it and then sells it to other people, but you can also directly sell it to a farmer's market, a food co-op, buying club, or a CSA. A CSA is, um, actually the Fresh Food Box is a good example of a CSA. But um, there are other CSAs where you pay the farmer upfront so that they can have um, actual cash in order to grow and to meet all of the needs. Um, and then you'll keep giving you fruits and vegetables throughout the growing season, right? Okay, so you've processed your, your carrots, take them to the farmer's market. Somebody takes them and, and um, takes them home, buys them. They'll dispose of them. And maybe if they don't want to use the carrot tops, they'll compost them and that goes back into this process. So you see there, a lot fewer steps and on average it's about your food travels about less than 250 miles and you it's probably one to three days between harvesting if you go to the farmer's market the food that you'll find there is is either the food that was harvested the day before and the, at the, the most it's um two days okay. So in New York City, there are about 140 farmers market, there are nine uh, food co-ops, and Grown YC has 17 fresh food box sites and 16, are they still 16 farm stands? 14? 15? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and so Green Market Co, as I said, is like the kind of middle person who buys them from smaller farmers who are unable to um, bring it to a farmer's market or who aren't able to, to um, grow enough to be in, in like a regular wholesale like you find at the Bronx Hunts Point, right? Um, there are a couple of polls that I would like us to actually. Yeah. And also so another I'm, good, sorry, did you, and another good thing about buying locally is the quality of produce itself. So you can imagine yes. if things are, traveling uh you know thousands of miles away from new york city um especially when it comes to fruits and veggies so the dry goods are not uh, that susceptible to you know uh spoiling well, but if you're harvesting you know apples or anything else mm -hmm. you can imagine only that they need to be picked when they are green um so they don't fully reach that their ripeness so things that do grow closer to new york city uh, tends to, you know, reach its peak in uh, season. That mean it, it meaning just it tastes better. It does. Thank you, Corey. Great. Okay, so as a little quiz, I'm going to launch, uh, I think, two polls. And if you have the option, you should see that right now. So the first question is, who are the first people to settle in the New York State area? Was it the Dutch, the British, the Iroquois, and Algonquin indigenous peoples, or the Polish? I don't think. Do you see that? I do see it. Okay. Uh, I don't think I have the option to work. 
so you can see. I can oh, I think because you're a co-host, a co-host, right? Oh, <laughs> that's that me. <laughs> Are there folks who can't see it? I see two people have voted. Oh, actually, more than two. Great. And then the second question is, which New York City neighborhood do you see be a thriving fishing community, fishing market? Last call. Okay, so who are the first people to settle in the New York State area? The correct answer was the Iroquois, the Olympian indigenous people groups. Uh, good job to those who got that. And which neighborhood in New York City used to be a thriving fishing market? Yeah, correct answer is the financial district. A couple of Upper East Side and Upper West Side in Harlem. There was no fishing in any of those neighborhoods, but good job. Um, the next poll is about what we just talked about. I'll launch it right now. So the first question is, where does most of the food we eat in New York City come from? Is it international sources or local sources? And the second question is approximately how many miles does, your, does food in a non-local food system travel before getting to you? Josiah, I see you trying to join. I, I hope everything's okay. All right, great. All right, so for the first question, where does most of the food we eat in New York City come from? The correct answer is local sources. A lot of the food that comes into New York City is actually coming from the rest of the US. And approximately how many miles does food in a non-local food system travel before getting to you? Correct answer is more than 2,000 miles. In a local food system, it's a little less than 250 miles. Thanks, y'all, for playing. Um, so where does Girl NYC come into this whole equation? Um, and in 1970, there was an, a huge Earth Day that happened. If you look at this picture here um, in the top right, that's Union Square. And there's a huge protest because um, folks were, were, were concerned about the environment. And um, I don't know if you remember the chart that I showed you with the decline in the number of, of family farms and the increase in the size of farms. What ended up happening is that there was a lot of industrial farming. And so there's a lot of pesticide use, a lot of um, use of huge machinery that also created air pollution. Um, these, all these like different things that were happening in agriculture actually did have an impact on the environment. And um, so you see a group of people in the 1970s came to protest and um, wanted the city to get serious and to do something about um, the city environment. And so in 1970, Rowan YC was formed as a mayor directive um, in 1976. We had our first green market on the Upper East Side on 59th Street and 2nd Avenue, right under the Queensboro Bridge. There were 12 farmers, you see that picture here on the bottom right. There were 12 farmers who are selling under the backs of their trucks. You can see it was packed. There were people everywhere. Um, and all of this was just an idea that we thought if we could connect the farmers who are living outside of the city to New Yorkers who are looking for fresh fruits and vegetables. Because as the city was growing, there was no more um, space for agriculture. And so the people who were actually growing their food were living far away from the people who were able, who, who could be customers, right? And a lot of farmers live right next to, to other farmers. So there wasn't any um, customer base for them. So what we created as an organization was a space for farmers and customers in the city to, um, to be able to meet, right? In 1976, the green market was moved from the 59th Street area to Union Square. We were asked by the city to try and um, reclaim that space. It was not, it was not a safe space and um, they wanted to try and co create a community around that area. So we started our organization specifically the Food Access 
space in order to promote reg regional agriculture. We wanted to give every New Yorker access to the best, most delicious locally grown foods. Um, and this is something that we still take seriously today. Because of that, you see, we try to make sure that we that every New Yorker, and we try as hard as possible. Um, if you look at this map, you see we have as many as many food access sites as we are able to. In we have at least one in every borough. We've got two farmers markets, even in Staten Island. Um, we have over two hundred family farms that are um, participating and involved in the green markets and the food and the fresh foods sorry, the farm stand and the fresh food boxes. We have 50 markets all over New York City. These half of them are seasonal. And right now it's the height of the season. So all of them are open. We've got 15 farm stands that operate. Um, and if you look, the yellow apples are the farm stands. And you notice that um, a lot of the yellow apples are in spaces where we're not able to have farmer's markets, which is also good access. Uh, point for people in, in, in other communities that aren't as close to farmers markets. We've got fresh food box sites where people pick up a box that they order a week before. And um, remember, I was talking about how a lot of the food, both international and domestic, comes from Hunts Point in the Bronx. What we are trying to do is we're trying to offer an alternative to the current foods, uh, non-local food system. And so we have a warehouse all the way in the Bronx, in the close to the Hans Point area, in the Hans Point area, am I? It is in Hans Point. Right? It's in, it's up further right now. We used okay. to be in Hans Point. We moved to a new location that's a temporary home until we rebuild this new hub that I think uh, Tupi is going to talk about in a second. But uh, we'll be back in Hunts Point, which is great because that's where the trucks are all going already. It's already part of the distribution route that um, the truckers are used to, which is great. Exactly. Yeah, trying, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Claire. Okay. And I also want to mention these are just uh, markets and the food access uh, places that mm -hmm. NYC runs. There's other organizations that also run farmers markets. So I think there's over like 200 farmers markets, 140 um, yeah. farmers markets in the city. Great. So th these are all these are not mapped, of course. Yeah, and these are so yeah, we're not the only ones doing this. Um, we are just probably maybe one of the oldest people who have been we've been around longer than most <laughs> folks. <laughs> I'm not old, but yeah. Yeah, you're not <laughs> you're <not even> <laughs> old. <laughs> True. Oldest organization. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, as I said, um, what Grow NYC is trying to do is we are trying to provide an alternative to foods that are coming from outside so that we can support farmers who live in our area. And if you take a look at this map, this is what we call our regional map. It shows where all the farmers who participate in our program come from. And this is us here in New York City. Um, our farm, most, most of the farmers in our program, well, actually all of our farmers in our program are local. And so they come from states that you can recognize, New York State, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, and they grow a, a variety of different things and either bring them to the market or send them to the, to the warehouse. And then that ends up getting to you guys at the farm stand. Um, so what, as, as an organization, we really value um, being able to have farmlands open and accessible, especially as cities continue to grow bigger and we want to be able to support the farmers who live in our area. So we're providing an alternative local um, food pathway to imported food. Who is the farmer up very north in Vermont? Are they the furthest or is Togo the furthest? To Maple, uh, um, ma um, Yep, it's maple. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a maple person. Like um, okay, maple syrup. Who does Lee work for? Mm. Yeah, maple. Doesn't matter. Syrup. One of the yeah. maple syrup folks. Yeah, one of the maple syrup folks. I can't remember what the name is, but um, yeah, they're the furthest. There's a couple. We used to get grains from Maine. Um, I don't think mm -hmm. we do that. Actually, you guys might. No, do we're that. not working with Maine grains right now. But okay. Yeah. So it's all New York City, I'm sorry, New York State based, but um, yeah. So I also just dumped in the chat for everybody the 
map of all of the markets and the farm stands in the city. It's the health buck map. So everywhere that the city is distributing health bucks, which all of you guys are at your farm stands, um, you can kind of see where those are spaced out. And so if you think that like Grow NYC should be more in more places, it's just important to remember that there's like other organizations doing this work too. And so uh, if there's already markets operating, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. We want, you know, to spread the love a little bit. Great. And um, thank you guys. And we've talked about just the local food system. And I want to talk a little bit more about what the benefits of, um, of supporting a local food system is. Um, as Corey mentioned, that most local food is harvested at its peak, and it obviously tastes better. I don't know if you all have had um, a tomato off of the tree. It's so much better than um, if you like buy a tomato in a grocery store in the middle of January. It's just not the same experience. Um, so local food is absolutely much better than anything you can find in a grocery store. It's more nutritious because it's had a shorter storage time um, and it hasn't been exposed to extreme temperatures like heat um, or cold, which would happen if you were importing or exporting something in a truck or in a ship and you had to um, put it somewhere before it was reached a grocery store. It helps to preserve the genetic diversity. Um, if you go to a grocery store, you'll find that they usually have like one kind of lettuce and one kind of, of carrot. Um, they tend to sell things that are popular, but in the farmer's market, because our farmers and the, and sorry, I'm not just saying the farmer's market, but in the Grow NYC community, um, a lot of our farmers like to one experiment with different um, types, older types of, of, um, of, of um, fruits and veggies. And so you hear things like heirloom varieties and heirloom just means something that's old and passed down. And so if you go to the farmer's market, you see things that you haven't, you won't be able to see in a grocery store. And you're able to trace where your food comes from. You're, you, you have this connection to the person who's growing it. You're able to ask them questions. That's not something that you can do in a grocery store. You're also supporting local families. Um, if you go to the farmer's market, you can see the people that you're supporting. You know where your money is going. It's not going to this huge corporation. And um, then um, it's going to people who are, one, going to use it to still invest in the land, but are also thinking about sustainability. And it's also going to go um, to supporting the fair pay of um, people who work at the markets and people who work at the farms. It helps to build community amongst the growers and consumers. Um, as I said, when we moved our market to Union Square, it completely changed the area around it. And a lot of people who have been longtime Union Square shoppers can tell you about how they feel like the market has been a very central place for them. Um, and now with our newer uh, food access sites, you can also tell a lot of folks feel like they're getting to know people who they shop with, the people who um, they see, they're getting to know you guys. And so we are creating spaces where people are able to one, connect with the people growing, but also build community with other people who are like-minded. Yeah, and as we're investing in agriculture, we're preserving the farmland for future generations. So either the farmer's children or you guys, if you're interested in farming, um, keeping farmland in use, um, we'll be able to preserve it so that it's not taken up for things like um, residences or economic um, infrastructure. It helps to keep taxes down. Farmers um, pay a lot of taxes, which is really great for us. Um, if we are supporting our farmers, then they also help put back that money into the community that we live in. They pay for public services like roads um, and a bunch of other things. It's also really good for the environment because um, a lot of the farmers who are part of our program use sustainable techniques. Um, and it's again, a good investment in the future because we're thinking about how to preserve the land, how to um, minimize the amount of pollution because instead of having three, four different types of transportation mechanisms, you just have the one where the farmer is driving the small truck from their farm right to the farmer's market versus if um, it was coming from outside of the US, it could come in by ship or by airplane or by um, large trucks. Okay. So before we go to the last spot, I have a couple, one last poll for y'all, just as a quiz. Okay. So the first question is, when did the first green market start? Was it 1970, 1976, 1980, or 1965? The second question is, how many farm stands does Grow NYC operate? 
is the answer 16, 20, 15, or 10? Okay, so I'll close it and all right. So the first question: When did the first green market start? It was 1976, correct? To those who got that, um, 1970 was when Grow NYC started. How many farm stands does Grow NYC operate? 15 is a correct answer. 16 was a trick question. Sorry, um, we operate 15 farm stands all over New York City. All right, so if you're thinking to yourself, how do I, um, what role and what part can I play in investing in a more sustainable food system? We have talked about how the um, non-local food system is not sustainable, it's not good for your environment, it's, it doesn't actually support local um, economic, your local economic structure and doesn't support your local community. So what can you do as, um, as a community member to invest in a more sustainable food system? These are three things that um, I have thought of that, and I would, I'm also going to put it back to you guys if you have any thoughts. Um, you can purchase food from local producers at a farmer's market, your um, CSA or a fresh food box, or you could go to a food co-op. You can start a garden right at home. Um, oh, show and tell. I have, <laughs> I've got, I don't know if you all can see, I've got a peppermint plant growing over here. I recently harvested and made some peppermint stuff, but you can do that at home. You can grow your own garden and grow your own food. That would be even more local than, oh, I think Daryl, I'll get to you. Um, even more local than getting in a farmer's market. You can also be a, 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 a knowledgeable consumer, read your food labels, um, pick foods that are coming from closer versus foods that are coming from far away. You can um, use your food choices to invest in a sustainable food system, right? So um, I'm gonna stop sharing because I want to hear from you all. What are your, Daryl, do you wanna go first? I see your hand. No, I have a question relating to, you know, how to give back to the community. Um, is there like a donation source that we could put back into growing my seed as a whole if not mine or growing, say local produce? Yeah, that's a great question and also a good idea on how to invest. You can actually donate money to Grow NYC. There's a donate button somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> I'll find it. Um, yeah, on our website, there are definitely on our website, you can yeah. encourage Ash other people to do that too. Um, yeah. But I, honestly, you guys working at these farm stands is, is huge. Um, you know, you're participating in your communities in this way and you're you have the opportunity to relay a lot of the information that you are learning in these sessions. Um, and so educating the community is a huge benefit just to like influence the way that other people think about this as well and how they think about their, their community and um, their economy and, and what they wanna be investing into. Yeah. You also don't only have to donate money, you can donate your time. We encourage people to volunteer. That's a really easy way for people to contribute to a local food system. Volunteer with your food co-op, you can volunteer with Grow NYC. There are lots of farmers markets and community um, gardens that you can volunteer at too. Yeah, if you guys are interested in getting connected to any community gardens near you too, we have a, a lot of relationships with uh, Green Thumb, for one, who organizes a lot of community gardens. Also, our greening program at Grow NYC has a lot of relationships with community gardens. Um, so there is probably something near you um, mm -hmm. that, you know, you could be involved in too. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you all. Before you took part in Grow uh, in the farm stand, is this is the food system something that you thought about? Is it something that you heard somewhere else? No, Daryl, no. All right, by show of hands, anybody who reads food labels? <laughs> All right, there's some. Okay, so good heads, right? Great. Yeah, um, 
our hope is that as you guys have um, interactions with the community members, that this is information that you can pass on. Um, usually folks, when you think when they think about climate change or they think about what's happening in the environment, um, it's very easy to become overwhelmed. There's a lot going on. Um, if anyone was outside yesterday, if you saw all that smoke, um, and it, it can be a little scary, but um, I think it's, it's, we need to focus on like the things that we can do. Um, and these are really great ways for somebody who has no um, information at all about um, the food system or the environment is a good way to like get them connected. So talking to people as they come up to you, someone walks up to you and complains about, why is this tomato so expensive? Um, I went to the market and it's only 50, I went to the grocery store and it's like 50 cents. You guys are um, trying to cheat. Um, it's, this is a good place for you to talk to them about, actually what we're trying to do is we're trying to invest in a local food system and we're trying to invest in farmers who are smaller um, compared to if you go to a grocery store, a lot of the farmers who are selling are selling wholesale and they're growing a lot more tomatoes. So if they sell a tomato at a loss, they're able to like take in that loss, but our farmers are small and mid-sized. They have to sell it one at a higher price and also depends on what, what the season is, right? And what you're buying. But um, if the price point is a little bit higher, it's because of all of these things that they're investing in sustainable methods, they're paying their workers as fair as they can, um, and they're also just not big enough to take up to like swallow any, co any costs. Any thoughts on this? Oh, Andrew, do you have a question? Um, I have like, a, I would like to share like my own experiences working with Please the do. Um, yeah, I feel like it's actually pretty relevant to like this idea of like, Getting, recognizing like our global like ecosystem and our food systems um, mm. and more so I feel today I saw more of like the inequalities and the disparities in our mm. in our food systems um so I worked at today I worked at East Harlem at PS57 mm -hmm. um and I would have to my say it was actually um, sorry that's my neighborhood I was excited <laughs> oh cool um I have to say it was a actually like a pretty profound experience um, today, uh, there was like a huge, like a huge rush of, of, um, of a customers and it was mm. kind of sparked by, um, Anthony, who I think is like, um, he's like, he distributes the health buck, um, coupons. Yeah. Um, and there was like a lot of, because of like, there's such a big rush and there's a lot kind of like miscommunications and things we could have done better on like the entire, like, like this, our entire, like a system of people who like make sure like things can, op can operate smoothly um but yeah. it was, um but what i saw from like today was that there's like the because of i guess the miscommunications and the failures um to get and we didn't have enough food for the consumers the customers okay. basically uh, and so there's obviously a lot of frustration but i think what struck me the most was mm -hmm. i think the how fierce and not desperate but how much there is a need for like proper nutrition and food. There's so much like this community, this community and these people, they really want the food. Yeah. But, um, and I was talking to Matthew um, and the reason like they, it, the, he says some really things, uh, he says some things that really like, like started like shifting the gears in my head. It's like, for example, like why is there such like a disproportionate amount of Asian and Hispanic people um, at these markets who are using EBT um, why is there like not so many like Caucasian of so mm -hmm. much of Caucasian population? Um, mm -hmm. why are these people, you know, immigrating from, uh, mm -hmm. places like, uh, um, like China or, um, uh, other places that are not America, um, to get access to food? Um, you know, why, why is this, this happening? And it like, it, it really like started to like turn my, the gears in my head and maybe start thinking about like these like the the inequalities and disparities in our system and how like mm. this is like it's, it's definitely like so much bigger than than all of us yeah well said. thanks so much andrew mm. yeah you know we're gonna have a presentation on food justice which we're gonna dive into a lot of those issues and i think it'll be really interesting to just yeah hear the history around this and how how it's evolved to be where we're at right now um, and ways that we can try to address it as much as possible, so. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
That was great. Thank you for sharing. And also, Daryl, I know that you said this is something you noticed. Thanks for sharing that. Um, any questions? It's, the time is 7 p.m. I don't want to keep you all too late. What I'll do is I just put a link to the evaluation. Oh, Daryl, go ahead. Do you have a question? Not as much as a question. I just that what he was talking about. A lot of that has to do with like location, preferably, mm -hmm. right? About where let's say I'm trying to get yeah, like a certain like a specific spot in my mind. Uh like agriculture, I guess. It's just yeah. which areas get more money from the government, which areas or more about wealthier just from people itself or jobs or yeah yeah no and also like in that chart that i showed you of all the declines there's like there's this huge american shift from supporting food that people eat versus like food that not even food like thing uh growing crops for sale which are commodity crops right and so the government is actually subsidizing a lot of those cash commodity crops because the government then gets more taxes. Um, but then what ends up happening is that food, the price of food goes up because the farmers don't get as many subsidies and as many um, um, like government interventions as for um, like things that we're not eating. So it is, it is part of our history that we've shifted the focus and we shifted where we're investing. Um, and you can see that in, in the prices of like fresh foods versus like, if you compared a pound of beans to like a can of beans, um, the prices are different and yet it should be the other way around. Like it should be more expensive to can and package something than it is to just like have it in its own form. But it is that there's, there is no investment in this fresh food um, and more investment in, in imports and in commodity crops, exports. Um, so we changed the way that we're collecting your participation. So now we have a form, which hopefully makes it easier. Um, I put the link to the form in the chat, but all of this is also available on the Google Classrooms page. <sighs> yeah. I know I have to remember, um, I don't want to leave you all on a sad. <laughs> um, I have to remember to like balance out um, the reality of, of our environment and where we're at with also just the hope and the the progress that I that we see. I mean, all of us here are a product of um, of a hope in our future and a hope in a change in the way our food system currently exists. So I hope nobody walks away feeling like despair, in despair that there's nothing we can do. But there is, I think we all have a role to play. We can do a little bit of, obviously it would be much better if bigger corporations, industries did more. But um, I still think that it's important for us as people who live in the community and people who like live in where we live to also do a little bit. And you also yeah. play a big role in helping folks do their part. Corey, yeah, a lot that? of it is also, yeah, a lot of it is also related to marketing. So you can only imagine if we were to see, you know, instead of McDonald's and all the fast food, you know, eat more veggies or eat more healthier variety food, um, yeah. we would be in a much better place. But uh, fortunately, the reality is that, you know, the big corporations have more money to sort of promote their own, um, I guess, way of life <laughs> put it yeah. that way but um yeah just just another thought okay so if there are no other thoughts i will leave you all to your evening thank you so much for participating we will be back here next week on tuesday and i believe phoebe will be here talking about resumes actually hold on let me make sure i'm giving you correct information <laughs> yeah and we'll make to. sure we have the correct link also yeah sorry that was um i set up a recurring thing in in the in the zoom and that's it like changed everything but next week we will be talking about yes we'll be talking about resumes how to why resumes matter and so phoebe will, will walk us through um hopefully a very interactive um process and Again, for those who are here and listening, please turn on your cameras next time. It was so great to see Angelica and Daryl and, and Andrew. Yeah.
we want to see everybody else's faces. So if you can designate this time, find a quiet space, a place where you can turn your camera and um, participate. It's only just an hour. Actually, next week's might be an hour and a half, but that's the only one. Usually it's just an hour long and then we'll leave you to get back to your evening. But thank you all for, yeah. for participating. Thanks all. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah.